public opinion is, is gradually changing, but there's still, uh, many of them are skeptical. We did have issues in the 80s and early 90s with diseases and the use of antibiotics. And the public opinion is, is shaped by some of these problems. The situation now is, is very different. Our planet and our civilizations are changing faster than ever before. Join me as I travel the globe talking to startup founders using technologies to make our world more interesting, accessible and livable. These are the entrepreneurs that are creating the future we will live in. This is Now Go Build. Norwegians have been fishing since before the agricultural revolution. Thousands of years. Of course, it's not just Norwegians with their stunning coastline who have turned to the ocean to feed themselves. Put humans near any ocean and they've always pulled fish out to survive. And thanks to advances in the technologies used to spot, track and catch fish, the world's fishing fleet has become very good at pulling out food from the sea. Too good. Left unchecked, without any doubt, we will catch the last wild fish. Add hydroelectric dams destroying salmon habitat, climate change warming and altering all of our oceans, and it's not surprising that wild fisheries around the globe are under incredible pressure, and many are in rapid decline. Today, fishing supplies 7% of the world's animal-based protein, and the world's fisheries are the only example where we've industrialized the hunting of wild animals. Wild fish account for more than 90 million tons of fish brought in by the global fleet every year. But almost equal to that massive volume is the amount of fish that is not caught in the wild, but is farmed. In large part, you can credit Norway and the Atlantic salmon for that. In the fjords that define this landscape and much of Norwegian culture, a whole new set of technologies are being deployed to bring more farmed fish to an ever-growing population around the globe. As it turns out, growing the ideal salmon for your favorite sushi roll is a data problem and one that can be solved. But aquaculture has its own set of ecological problems to overcome. From the concentrated waste of penned fish to crossbreeding and disease-infecting wild salmon runs. The broader question is whether solving those problems also solves a much bigger one. Is fish farming in large pens at sea the answer to supplying salmon and other fish to an ever-growing human population? Can we really solve the issues associated with fish farming with better technology? And can we do it without it creating a much larger problem along the way? Fish farming generates one kilo of consumable protein for every kilo of feed. If sustainability is the byproduct of efficiency, then it may indeed be a technology solution we're looking for. To get a clearer picture, I decided to speak to Sigurd Stefansson, a professor of biological sciences at the University of Bergen. We decided to meet at Bergen's central fish market. What is the history behind fish farming here in Norway? Well, it's, it's all going back to, let's say, the, the late 60s, early 70s. They picked up some of the technology from uh, Japan, uh, the sea cages. They were quite primitive at first, um, but they later developed into the, the, the large cages we see now. They brought in wild strains of salmon in the, in the late 60s, early 70s as a founder population. So we're now looking at the 13th or 14th uh, generation of selected salmon. They have been selected for late maturation, fast growth, uh, disease resistance. So what are the biggest challenges for uh, the fish farmers here? One that has to be mentioned first are the salmon lice. These are little parasites. They've always been on the, on the wild salmon. But the number of salmon now along the coast is so huge. They are thriving in these conditions. They multiply, they re-infect the salmon in the cages. But the biggest concern is that these larvae of the, of the salmon lice also infect the wild migrating smolts as they leave the river and enter the ocean. 
So this is a major challenge. We have an obligation to take care of the wild strains of salmon. What are the biggest challenges around data and data collection uh, with respect to salmon? So in order to get uh, 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 an idea of the salmon lice infestations, a number of fish are actually removed from the cages and the lice are counted. If you could see a system where the, where the fish wouldn't have to be handled, you would have like a, a video of the fish. Uh, and if they can spot the salmon, either manually or automatically, this would be a, a major uh, improvement in the uh, surveillance of the sea lice population. Near Bergen, one of the epicenters of aquaculture, the company Aquabyte is using machine learning and high-tech cameras to begin solving some of these problems. I wanted to meet the founder of Aquabyte and see how they were approaching some of these challenges. Hi guys, Frank Werner. Nice to meet you. So tell me what we're going to see today. Yeah, so we're going to Blom Schipikommen, which is one of our the farms that we work with. Okay. It's in the middle of the fjord, there's three pens and a salmon farm and trout farm. Okay. So if the pens are out there in the water, where is your technology? Is it here on land or where is it? Yeah, it's in the barge by the pens. Okay. Well let's go and have a look there. Okay. So is there anything particular about the Norwegian waters that makes it very good for fish farming? Two, two things, we've got, we got a lot of fjords, which is perfect for the, it's like sheltered locations. Okay. Uh, so, and of course there's a pure and clear water. So the waters are really calm here, isn't it? Is it always like this? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what we're seeing here. Yeah, so this is a typical salmon pen in Norway. It's 160 meters in circumference, so the diameter is like about half a football field. Each pen has anywhere from 100 to 200,000 individuals at a given time. Okay. So in the middle of the pen is the feeder, and it's constantly dispensing feed. And okay. So the fish are coming up to eat. They're feeding all day, so the, you can see the pen is actually spraying out feed okay. right now. And we're watching with camera from below. So there's an operator remotely that's watching the fish while he's eating. Okay. So if there's any pellets that come through the, the, the school as such, then they, they stop the feeding. Ah, okay. Why are they jumping above the water? Well, uh, they're just enjoying it, yeah. I think. They're having fun or yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here we're on a feed barge. Um, there, there's someone here all day and their full-time job is to monitor the pens. They're watching for pellets and, and dispensing the food. And so part of the vision for the company is yeah. to ultimately get to a place where we can take a lot of that farmer's intuition and automate it using software. So tell me, where did you get the idea? How did this all get started? I actually grew up in Ithaca, New York. Studied at Princeton. Um, studied uh, kind of operations research, financial engineering. After that, worked in Wall Street in algorithmic trading, so building models to buy and sell stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, got into a series of startups, um, the last of which was involved in cancer detection using computer vision. And so this company kind of borrowed elements of the, the previous two companies and that a lot of what we're trying to do relates to computer vision and optimal decision making. Okay, cool. What was your first engagement with a Norwegian fish farmer? How did you convince them that this was a path that they needed to go? Well, um, obviously the, the, the technology itself is, is uh, quite complex. But uh, from, from my perspective, it's, it's what it does. It, what it's, uh, it's replacing manual, tedious work with uh, some kind of automized uh, system. With most beginning data sets in machine learning, you need humans to sort of label it or to indicate the kind of things that you're looking at. Uh, I can imagine how that works with one fish. But you've got 200,000 fish in a pen and 50 meters deep and with different weather circumstances, what were the particular challenges that you had to solve? So first I think is just the challenge of being able to get a camera in the pen, have the right optics. There's a lot of challenges with particles in the water and light scattering and, and various things like that. Um, once you're able to get the image of a single fish, then it's being able to sample lots of fish throughout the day. Yeah. So, so this is your camera. Yeah, so this is our first R&D camera. It's a stereo camera, which allows us to perceive depth. 
and we're using that depth information to help us determine the size of the fish. Okay. The feeding, it kind of goes in a circle, and so um, the, the fish are swimming in a torus in the pen okay. around. And so we're putting the, the camera facing parallel to the fish as they swim by. So how much software is running on the device itself? Yeah, so there's a microprocessor on the camera as well that's okay. doing some light filtering. So okay. Some of the images we capture, the fish is partially in frame or it's blurry or it's dark and so we try to filter the images as close to the source as possible. Okay, so, very cool. Yeah. Solving a problem that affects millions of fish at microbial level requires collecting data far beyond the ability of the naked eye. Collecting robust datasets from the middle of a Norwegian fjord is hard enough. But the processing of that data happens in the cloud, which requires connectivity. Every solution creates more problems to solve. So these are antennas and they, okay. they provide connectivity from the pen to the barge. So you send your data over that. Right. Uh, do you store it here? Right, so we do some processing at the pen, some processing on the barge. Okay, and then you bring it out into the cloud as well. So you must have connectivity from the barge to the mainland. Right, so the barge also has internet, so we can get a couple hundred megabytes per second. Pretty good, out yeah, here. Pretty good. Very yeah. good. So lice, I understand, is one of the biggest challenges. So tell me about sort of recognizing lice in the water or on the fish. Absolutely. So the salmon lice is a big problem in Norway. It's actually 25% of the cost of running one of these farms. Um, and so the, the lice, it's, it's naturally occurring. Uh, but in these fish farms, um, because the fish are close together, they can often have infestations. And so we're being able to take a picture of the fish and then understand when a farm needs to make a delicing decision. There's regulations around tracking for lice as well. So how did it traditionally happen? So this is regulated in Norway by the Norwegian Food and Safety Organization. They require each of the farms to be able to sample every week 10 or 20 fish from their pens. Uh, right now, they go out to the pens, they net the fish, anesthetize them, and then count the sea lice one by one. And so yeah. this is a pretty tedious process for a farmer to go out and do this. And it's also harmful for the fish because you're handling them. But it's also statistically insignificant. Absolutely. Right. I mean, yeah. 20 fish out of us at per pen, 200,000? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's not really a representative uh, sample. Have you been, guys been talking to uh, the Norwegian government as well, is that actually your mechanisms are way more accurate than, let's say, the, the hand counting of sea lice? Absolutely. The government's quite positive about the solution because it reduces the handling of the fish, okay. it's more accurate, and we're on track to be the first device approved for electronic replacement and dispensation at this farm. Okay, so uh, image recognition plays an important role in, in all of this. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So are, are these algorithms that you've developed yourself? Yeah, so the basis for the computer vision image recognition is based on a convolutional neural network. Okay. And so we're using similar technology that they've used at social media companies and autonomous vehicle companies and adapting that for the underwater domain. Okay. And so a lot of the same models to recognize an uh, animal or um, a human face, we've adapted it to be able to identify fish in the image uh, and identify various body parts, um, be able to uniquely identify fish and other okay. things as well. Yeah, the secret source really here is in the processing of the data. Yeah, yeah and the collection of data over time. So how did you get to the original data set? Um, to start off, for the sea lice counting and for the weight estimation, we use a human in the loop approach. So what happens is before we have any data set, we'll go and we will capture an image. We'll have one of our team members, former fish farmers, go in and annotate the sea lice or okay. annotate various body parts. And when they do that, they're generating training data that provides a training data set mm -hmm. for the model. And so over time, we're accumulating a large data set that more and more of that can be automated. Uh, you were going to share with me the weight distribution as well. Yes, so the second thing we focused on was the, the weight distribution. So ultimately, farms like this, they're selling to the Whole Foods, Costco's of the world, and they have contracts in advance for certain sizes. And so we can see the number of fish in each weight bucket, as well as how much the farm has already sold. And so here they know if they're actually growing the right amount or if they oversold or undersold. Yeah. 
So I'll just show you here. Mind your head. All right, and this, this is where the fish food is coming from. It's contained here in the silos, it's going down to the doser system and throughout to the pens. Okay. And it will be like, uh, like this. Yeah, okay. this is how it looks like. Okay. So what is this made of? It's uh, about 70% vegetables okay. in practical, or soya proteins, really, and it's 30% marine. So you should try it. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. okay, okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> For us, uh, it's it's part of a larger uh, kind of initiative towards food sustainability. So if you think about the, the Earth is largely covered by water versus land, and it's one of the most energy efficient ways to produce protein uh, in contrast to chicken or beef. And so it's almost one to one in terms of kilograms of food per kilograms of, of feed. And if you look at the, the world's food supply is generally going 1% year over year, fish farming is growing 6% year over year, and this is kind of matched the growing protein deficit. Yeah, apparently the lack of protein or the deficit of protein seems to be a rising problem. So a lot of it is driven by population growth and also changing consumption habits in countries like China and India where you have the rising middle class. It's in these places where um, they, they, they just need a lot more high quality protein. And, and this is an extremely efficient, sustainable mechanism of creating protein. Yeah, that's the problem is, I mean, you stand at the side of a pen, you can only see maybe 5%. The fish you're growing are relatively unobservable. And so this is kind of the first time they've been able to see in the pens and see how much they're actually producing. How do we reconcile the environmental challenges of industrialized fishing and aquaculture? How do we continue to supply a much needed source of protein without wiping out salmon altogether? There's rarely one answer to a problem, and this problem is no exception. As the world's population grows, and we try to make up for lost time in learning how to manage our finite resources, it is thinking like aquabytes that will help us to return to being good stewards of earth and sea.